Welcome, and thank you for tuning into The City Imagines Parenthood, hosted by The Word on the Street Toronto. I'm Evan Dixon, Watts Board Director, and I'll be your host tonight. This is Episode 5, Season 3 of The City Imagines. Tonight we're exploring the idea of parenthood in the modern age. That's one of my favorite topics. In a moment, we'll be joined by parents and writers Andrea Bennett, Aaron Pepler, and Gillian C., who will be in conversation tonight with Sarah Ime Tiang. Before we get into what the city imagines, we need to recognize what it already is. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the F Credit, uh, excuse me, uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805, with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto rec also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the, the Huron-Wendat and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is sub the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to share, to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Takaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land, and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. If you want to be the first to know about new videos and events from the Word on the Street in 2022, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you enjoy tonight's talk, please give this video a like so others can find it as well. Recently, we announced that our fest annual festival is returning to the street. We are thr thrilled to be bringing Toronto's favorite book festival back to Queen's Park Circle next month on the weekend of June 11th and 12th. It will offer over 60 panel and feature author events, 90 marketplace exhibitors, and two full days of readings and activities for kids and families. Make sure you are subscribed to our newsletter to stay up to date with information about this year's exciting two-day festival and marketplace. Our full festival schedule is now available on our website, please visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca for more information on what's next from Watts. Now, I am pleased to welcome our moderator for the evening, Sarah Ime Tiang. Sarah is the author of Status Update, nominated for the Pat Lowther Award, and the Gerald Lampert Award-winning Sweet Devilry. Her new book, Grappling Hook, is forthcoming with Palimpsest Press. She is the poetry editor for Arc Poetry Magazine, and the creative director of Poetry and Voice. Welcome, Sarah, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, and actually my book is now no longer just forthcoming, but here, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists who are absolutely fantastic tonight. We have Andrea Bennett, who is a National Magazine award-winning writer and the managing editor of the TIE. Their most recent book, Like a Boy, but not a boy, is a totally riveting read and the depth and complexity that Andrea brings up in their essays are phenomenal. I promise you that this is a book that you will think about for a really long time. Erin Pepler is a freelance writer who lives in the greater Toronto area. She's the author of Send Me Into the Woods Alone. I just have to make sure I'm doing this right with the camera. Uh, a collection of essays on motherhood. Erin's book is funny and relatable, and you will find yourself staying up much too late thinking, okay, just one more essay. Jillian C. is the author of multiple poetry collections and picture books. Quiet Night Think, and I'm going to get her to hold up the book because I just have a PDF, explores the early shaping of a writer, the creative process, and motherhood. Now, that's the copy in the bio, but what the copy doesn't say is that this book is beautiful in the extreme. Blending together poetry and essays, this artful, gorgeous piece of literature is just a gift to humanity and especially to parents. So it's just like wonderfully thrilling to be with these incredible authors tonight. Welcome everyone. It's great to be here and um, and and thank you for the lovely summaries of our books. I'm going to like take a screenshot of your description <laughs> and save it to look at later <laughs> when I'm feeling down. <laughs> well, Word on the Street seems to have a knack for picking books that I have like that I actually really, really like, <laughs> which makes it kind of wonderful being the moderator. Um, being able to read these books is 
just in, just absolutely incredible. Um, and they're all so different, yet they, they really kind of vibe really well together. And one thing that I kind of wanted to start on, because I know that all of us have experienced this, is I wanted to know how parenthood has affected your process in writing. So whether you're writing before parenthood and then how things change because inevitably they do change. Jillian, I know that you talked a little bit about this in your book. Would you like to start us off? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there was, uh, I guess, first and foremost, there was a, a material change. Um, I used to, you know, used to, there was a lot of, you know, long, these long stretches of time where you can, you know, go to a coffee shop and just work and read and not to, and you can put your coffee at the edge of the table and that was fine <laughs> um, and I and you know I still carry a notebook around but I you know I found myself kind of like ending up using my, my phone a lot um, because it was the only thing that lit up in the dark right when you're when you're nursing at night and so there was these sort of material changes and, um, the realization also that you know we're, we're finite beings with only so many hours in a day and um, so time was it was a major major factor. Um, that sort of leisurely quiet, um, I think, was, was gone, um, especially in the early days of motherhood. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know about anybody else, but did you find um, after having your children, was there a long fallow period, or did anybody write right through it? Oh, I had it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andrea. I was just gonna say. I uh, I wanted to answer. I wanted to answer your first question. Um, what uh, one thing? So I have written from the perspective of being like someone's kid uh, from from time to time, um, and uh, and my childhood. And part of that was, uh, you know, there's some tricky ethical questions that come up if you're writing about your childhood if you have a fractured relationship with a parent. Uh, in my case, um, one of my parents is an alcoholic. We don't speak anymore. And I carried some guilt about whether or not I should have written about that or how much of it was my story, that kind of thing. And actually having a kid, I'd been told that when I had a kid, I would learn. I'd learn that I was such an ungrateful person that I never should, you know. And it actually crystallized the opposite thing for me. I was like, I'm fine to write about this. Like, uh, I understand now, like, what the role of my kid is and what my role as a parent and Anyway, whatever. So I wanted to answer that part of your question. And then uh, I did something to myself that made it impossible to have a fallow period, which was um, I sent a nonfiction book proposal into the world. It <laughs> got accepted. And so um, we actually moved across the country with, with a five-month-old. I got a job at um, Talon Books. And initially before that, um, we were kind of splitting. We were both freelancing, my partner and I, and we're splitting childcare. Um, with our with work and when we moved across the country my commute was um, three hours a, a day it was like an hour and a half one way and so I wrote all the notes for uh, like a boy but not a boy um, pretty much on the bus and the train usually in the morning by the evening I was dead and playing Tetris um, <laughs> but in the yeah so so I, that's one way. That's one way to not have a fallow period. I don't know if I would wholly recommend it. It's hard. Yeah, it does get a bit more complicated to carve out time. I would say. I'm not living in. I'm not living. I don't have that hour and a half commute anymore. So I have to be more intentional about finding pockets of time, at the coffee shop often in the morning before the pandemic. But now actually, it's even harder because I don't feel like totally comfortable going to public spaces anymore mm -hmm. quite yet in the same way I used to. So I haven't, I mean, I pitched another book and I also, <laughs> I gotta figure it out. <laughs> I love that you pitch your books and then figure it out later. And I totally <laughs> get you because I also used to have a commute about that length too. I was going from um, Kingston to Mississauga and uh, I, I did also do a lot of my writing um, on, on the train as well and a lot of my work on the train too because mm -hmm. when you're captive and nobody's screaming at you too, it was almost kind of an ideal time to write. Yeah, Erin, how about you? I definitely had a period where I wrote very little uh, after my kids were born, but a lot of it was a lack of mental energy and also logistics because the way our household was, um, we had our kids, I was fairly young. I was like, not super young, but I was 26 when my daughter was born. I was just a couple of years out of university. Um, and 
my husband's income was so much higher than mine that I said, you know what, I'd really like to just go to part-time and freelance and be with the kids for a few years and then kind of get back into it. But then we ended up moving. So he ended up with this big commute. And so he was the one on the train and he was the one gone. And I was with my kids pretty much from the moment they woke up because he left before they woke up until he got home, like right at dinner time and bedtime. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time we were done with, he would literally walk in the door, help with dinner, help with bedtime. And then that was the day. And so by then, after being with your kids alone for 12 hours and then doing like the dinner time rush with your partner, like I didn't have any mental energy left. So I just wrote down ideas for a long time, but I always joke with people like, you know, this book is that I wrote was essays on motherhood. And it's not really a coincidence that it came out like the year that my youngest child is turning 10. Um, <laughs> I don't think like I marvel at people who have the capacity to write a book when they have a baby or a toddler. I didn't. And I know everyone's situation is different, but I, I just didn't have the energy mentally. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important, though. I think that, um, you know, I didn't either, <laughs> especially for <laughs> my my first um for my for my daughter and I just felt like that was fine because I didn't think of myself as a writer um and then there was all this pressure after I had a few books out and I, and I thought oh I have to produce I have to produce and it took me a while to remember I'm a poet and nobody's waiting for my books you know <laughs> like, it's just like sometimes we just we we put all of this this pressure on ourselves um and all of these expectations which I think maybe naturally comes um with becoming a parent. And I want to talk a bit about that too. It, in, in all of your, your books, the idea of um, guilt and labor it comes up um, because I think it's intrinsically tied <laughs> to parenting. Um, and so, so how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with, you know, working on projects, working on paid jobs and also, you know, giving yourself space to be in the world and to parent? I think that um, on the guilt front, part of what, of what I feel like I'm doing, what we're doing like for our kids is like modeling how to live and be in the world. And so for me, um, some of that potential initial guilt around, I mean, being away from the, from my house for 11 hours a day was too long. And especially with a, with a kid who is still exclusively um, nursing, it was really tricky. But at this point I work from home um, and, uh, and the balance there is okay. Like there's some days where I feel like, oh, you know, some more quality time would have been good. But in terms of um, taking a weekend away, I sometimes take like a writing retreat away. Um, and my partner will take a weekend away also. We try to sort of do that for each other. And I feel like it's important for our kid to see that, to see us prioritizing ourselves from time to time. Um, because then hopefully she'll grow up and she'll learn that that's something like she can choose to do also. So yeah, I'm not saying like the balance doesn't get out of whack sometimes. There are days where I have really long work days and then I'm like, oh, we okay, note to self, like block in time tomorrow, we're gonna like hang out and like mindlessly play Duplo or <laughs> or, or read a book, uh, you know, at the end of the workday instead of zooming right into like dinner preparation or I'm gonna include my kid in dinner preparation instead of being like, I'm gonna listen to a podcast now, I'm so tired, please go play elsewhere. Um, but anyway, that's where I've landed. It's probably imperfect and I'm curious to hear where everyone else has landed too. I think for me, it sounds bad, or maybe it doesn't. I always thought it sounded bad, but I always tell people who are worried about like mom guilt or parent guilt, like lower your standards. <laughs> um, and it's not like your kids don't deserve the very best and they deserve like this half-assed parenting. That's not what I mean by that. I just think people, we put such high expectations on ourselves that if that's what we're striving for, it's going to just lead to burnout right away. And you're always going to feel guilty because you're not going to be perfect and nobody's a perfect parent. But if that's what you're aiming for, like you're just hurting yourself. So there are definitely days, like Andrea said, where I'm like, oh, I work too much today or I'm too tired to really like engage with my kids. But if I were to look at like what percentage of the time I'm like that, it's pretty low. Um, so I try not to 
really dwell on the times that like we aren't having that like awesome quality time or that I feel like work is eaten up too much of my time that week because I know that there's a lot of other times that are really, really good. And I don't look back on my childhood and remember like the one or two busy work days my mom had in a week. Like I remember the fun <laughs> stuff we did. So I try to be realistic about like, this isn't ruining my kids' lives that I have a lot of deadlines and I'm ignoring them a bit. And also in my case, and I think in a lot of people's cases, like I'm lucky I'm in a two parent household. So like when my kids aren't with me, they're usually with my husband. And I'm like, they're not, they haven't been abandoned. They're with a loving parent. So like, what does it matter that I'm, you know, off doing something for myself for work or for myself personally, like they're okay. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I like, yeah, I like every, what everyone else is, is saying. I, I, I can be a, a bit of a wreck, I think quite regularly. And because the kids just restart every 24 hours you, you can't um del dwell on those those guilty moments or you know um I, you know i i struggled a lot with um figuring out you know just the sort of identity of becoming a parent um i mm. you know i was a full-time student i defended my phd when i was hugely pregnant and like 10 days later my son was born so i had a very tiny period of time where it was just you know, just me, just not being a student, but also not being mm -hmm. a mother, and then going from full time student to, to full time mother. And there's a lot of anxiety that that came with that. Just figuring out, will I write again? <laughs> I'm so tired. Will I write again? Um, and I, I like what um, Andrea mentioned as well about just having, you know, being very lucky that there's another project on the go. Just the way things are timed, even in publishing, there are these long stretches of wait, and so I was, I was quite fortunate. Um, to still feel like a, a writer, uh, the the book that uh, Jessica Hingster and I edited was launched just when my son was a few months old, and I had you know we, I was able to still feel like I was you know in the literary world while nursing my son in the back room at the bookstore. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I also you know even when I was pregnant, I didn't read any books about nursing. I didn't read any books about sleeping. Uh, I was reading books like, you know, Rachel Cusk's Life's Work. I was reading Stephanie Bolster, uh, recommended reading Double Lives, which is about motherhood and writing. And that was clearly my concern. It was like, the baby's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to figure myself out. So I think that that was helpful in terms of adjusting because I read so many other parents' experiences in terms of being a writer um, and just feeling out that, you know, the identity, the new identity and how it they work their way through that um but it's still I still think it's ongoing I you know I, I have a, a good friend who just was very upfront and was like you cannot be everything at once and you just like what Aaron said just lower that standard just accept that you know you, you'll try to be everything it's not gonna happen so just <laughs> give up on that dream <laughs> it's so true I feel sometimes I often think of it as being like on a balancing board and you're just mm -hmm. constantly wobbling, right? <laughs> and you're never, you're never going to get that, that, that right balance. And sometimes you like fall or you like hit hard on one side, but then you just kind of got to get up again and try, try to re regain the balance there. I was thinking about one of the things that Andrea um, mentioned when they were talking about, you know, writing about parents and writing about others and the ethics behind that. And I know that that's something that I get asked about a lot in my own writing because I write a lot about my kids. Um, I was wondering how you guys um, think about that and and if you had any hesitations about writing, not only about parenthood, but also including your children in your writing um, and how you, how you kind of process that. I'm really, really private about my kids. And I think one of the first things that um, I clarify to people a lot of the time it's like I wrote a whole book of essays on motherhood so I don't even name my children in the book <laughs> I refer to them as my son my daughter you know my eldest my youngest that kind of thing um, in any public channel I have my kids faces aren't online their names aren't online and I really for me was like I'm going to write about motherhood and it's like my experience of being a parent and being um, their parent so it is shaped by them um, and I talk about things that I looked at through the filter of like, is this too, like, are they vulnerable in this situation? Like if I'm 
talking about things when they're babies or toddlers, I kind of think like a lot of that is like baby toddler nonsense that all kids do. It's not specific to their lives. Um, so that stuff I was pretty free with, but now that they're older, like I'm very conscious of like they're tweens now, at least my older one, and they're going to grow up in such an online public space just among their friends and the world and like their social lives that they don't need me adding to that and complicating that. But then I always feel like I have to then qualify that and be like, there are people who share a lot more than me, including like some of you guys who share more than I do, but do it beautifully and do it really respectfully. So it's not like inherently bad to share about your kids. I think it's just some people are really good at doing it very carefully. And for me, I was more comfortable not doing it very much at all. But it's tricky. I find it harder when it's um, like Andrea said, parents or siblings, like I have a line in my S in one of my essays that I made sure stayed in because it was talking about something I felt about my childhood and it got trimmed down from like, and for me, this is what happened to, they wanted to take out that and for me. And I was like, no, no, no. Cause I can't speak for my brother and sister. They were in the same house. They were in the same childhood, but three people can have very different reactions to things and very different experiences in the same household. So I'm very, very conscious of only speaking for myself um, I'm always impressed when, when people, I think I'm a little too tentative about speaking about other people. Like I would like to have like a little more of the brave that some of you guys have. <laughs> I think you do it really well. I am. Um, I'm trying out something new in, in the book I'm writing now, which is I wrote an essay. If this one is this upcoming one is about like food culture and food production and stuff. Um, and one of the essays is about a particular restaurant I worked in that there, there are some fraught times. A lot of us, a lot of the folks I was dealing or uh, working with who are my close friends were dealing with some substance abuse issues and things of that nature. And so I wrote the first draft. And then after I wrote the first draft, I was like, okay, what would happen if I reach out to some of these friends that I, still really care for but who I haven't like connected with in a long time but because of social media we're still sort of like orbiting each other's lives and so I'm trying that now um and then the family I'm not estranged from I did write about them in in like a boy but not a boy um in talking about uh what parent term I chose which was ultimately nothing because they shot down so many of them and so I wrote I wrote in one particular essay about just being frustrated being pregnant and and hangry and frustrated with them but I mean it was all stuff that they that they that they knew um so so that's something I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying out with with some of those fraught moments it's like running them by those folks and seeing how they feel about it and think about it and I, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But um, in terms of writing about Sink, uh, my kid who's four, I do write about her from time to time. I share like the cute stuff she's or the funny stuff she's because she's very funny. Um, but I haven't actually shared any pictures of her online. Um, and she loves having photos taken of her, and it, she's a bit of a ham. So I think she would be will be okay with it. She can't. Yeah, she consents, but like a four year old can't can't really exactly um she just sees the thing that she drew like on a picture of it on the internet she is stoked about it <laughs> but <laughs> yeah anyway so so I think that I might like tone that down you know I think now ish is around the time that I probably need to stop sharing so much because yeah she is turning from from cute adorable preschooler into uh yeah um <laughs> There, there, I think there is a transition that happens there that that I that I probably should. But she just says such funny things, and I want to share that with the world. I need to stop. <laughs> no, well, like I, I yeah. go ahead, Jillian. So I was gonna say, Erin, you bring up a really great point, and I like I like that 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 you know when when they get older, they become just more increasingly just more of their own subject that we have mm -hmm. to. Um, and you guys with social media and everything that's already out there, like. Are you going to tell them an embarrassing story just for your art? <laughs> you know, I don't know, right? These are questions for sure that writers have. Um, I think when I was I was thinking about just when I was writing Quiet Night, I think because there are so many um, not only my own experiences with my my children, but also my 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 parents' experiences. Um, I think what I what I was doing as I was writing was obviously trying to find how they really overlapped with my story, um, mm. and and being as generous as 
possible as well in terms of how I depicted um, my, my family. Uh, I certainly showed it to them. I let them know, you know, before everything happened or before it was, I mean, before it was published. I, I did, you know, highlight the sections and just, just so they were aware. And my father is an engineer. He's very analytical. He was like, mm-hmm, this is accurate. Yes. <laughs> like, that was it. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't, he was like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Very accurate. Yes. <laughs> Do you guys find that people say yes? Because the one thing I'm curious about with all of you as writers is, so I've done similar things. And with my book, I gave passages or essays to people who are mentioned, even kind of like if it's a little tangent where they're referenced, like there's a mom at the school and I re- I'm t- talking about a conversation with my daughter where my daughter comes home and says, oh, so-and-so's friend, um, her mom has cancer. And so it's a very small couple of paragraphs where I'm talking about this conversation I had with my daughter, but obviously that like is about somebody else. And so I went to her and said, if I reference this, are you comfortable with it? And here's the context. And please say no, if you feel even a little bit uncomfortable. And so I had conversations like that. And then there was other things where if it was someone in my family, I would say, do you want to read this essay? I would like it if you did. And so, but do you ever, any of you have an experience where someone goes like, you know what, just do you, I, I don't want to. Because I had that happen once or twice, <laughs> just being like, you know what, I don't want to interfere with what you're writing. So I'm just going to trust you. And then you go, oh, that's a lot of responsibility. You trusting me? <laughs> my dad, my dad's like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I told him I was going to write about like at, um, this moment in, in, in Tobmori where I was pregnant and hangry and trying to try out different parent terms. And, and he was like, okay, great. And I didn't run it by him. Yeah. Um, so like after the fact, he just knew that I was going to write about it and that was fine. Um, yeah. And I don't always like let, let who I'm writing about, let see the, the past. I think Will, my partner read, um, the draft of like boy, but not a boy before it went out. Um, cause he's kind of interspersed in there. Um, but no, my dad didn't. Uh, my dad just knew I was going to be like lightly roasting him <laughs> and that was fine. And I think with the essay, with the essay um, that I'll, that I'm currently working on about that, about the restaurant situation, I don't think I'll share it with those folks. I think I'm just going to like have conversations with them where I outline what my first draft was like and, and get their feedback and see if I can, if I can share anything from what they've said in the essay is how I'm going to approach it. It's, it's case by case for me, really, I think. Um, and then some people I, I don't ask, I don't ask the parent, the family I'm estranged from. I don't, I know I, they, yeah, our understandings of reality are completely different and it, it would not be productive. So, <laughs> yeah. Jillian, what about you? Oh, on you. Sorry, <laughs> Um, uh, I haven't, you know, I, I've, that's, I mean, that's, I, I agree with Aaron, like having someone say that that's a lot of pressure, <laughs> that's a lot of responsibility, I'm like, oh, um, but I, I, I mean, quiet night thing is different for me because it's sort of my, you know, my first kind of move into, into prose, into, into the essay form, um, I think with poetry, just the form itself, there's, lot of space in there so I, I feel like I can draw from real life from real people from real conversations and have that space um, available for for interpretation I think um, it was very it was, it was um, and Aaron I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too like just what, what what it's like to write an essay I mean for me it felt in some ways a lot more intimate which I think was um, surprising when I say that uh, because people often think it's poetry that's more intimate. And I think they're both intimate forms, <laughs> but, but something about the essay, something about the sentence, something about just staying with my reader for that long, even just the way it looks on the page, you know, just this block of text, I'm very present. And um, I, yeah, I felt a lot more vulnerable writing, writing those essays than, than I do with poetry. I feel like with poetry, it's not that there's obfuscation that happens, but some of what you're communicating is coming through metaphor or um, you're communicating your tr- a truth in a different way and you don't have to necessarily share all of the details. And in an essay, 
you know, if you if you move quickly into metaphor, your editor is going to come back and be like, hey, um, some details are missing here. <laughs> so I, I get, yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. They do both feel like intimate forms, but in different ways. That's actually really good to hear because I was listening to you guys talk and I was thinking about my own writing. And I'm like, man, I write about everyone. I write about everyone and I ask no one basically. And I just <laughs> reveal everything. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, the time, my husband's usually like very, very supportive. But um, when I started, so I have um, my little, littlest one, he's 19 months now, but he was a he was a surprise and so I was writing about that whole process and I was writing about like the decision whether or not to have an abortion and like publishing these poems and it was a little bit like you know he's maybe gonna read these at some point I was like well maybe it's important for him to know that I had a choice and he was wanted and it's because I had a choice that I can say you were absolutely a wanted child I you know yeah you were not a, something that was forced upon me um but yeah, I think I'm a lot more cavalier with the whole writing. It's funny that you say that, Sarah. I, I, this whole running by, uh, you know, the text by, it only really happened with the essays. With the oh. poetry, same thing. I don't think I've, I've ever been like, are you okay with me mentioning it? I just, it just it kind of shows up. But it, for some reason with the essay, mm -hmm. I think it's just, it's so explicit. It's like, yeah. my yeah. father's father, you know, <laughs> like, there's no... <laughs> metaphor there <laughs> well and you're sharing what's in your head too which I know with poetry like I I don't write poetry so I love poetry but I can't pretend to understand how to write it at least in any good way but for essays I think for me because I do all like creative nonfiction, personal essay you're getting like here's the story of what happened but you're also getting that like and here's the narrative inside my head and how it affected me and how it changed this thing going moving forward and all of this stuff so I can have like a straightforward interaction with somebody and it could be very, I can present it and be like, this is what happened. And they're like, yeah, factually, that's what happened. But they don't know all that other stuff. And so they don't have that voice inside my head or that like how it changed my thoughts on something or how it gave me a bit of anxiety. And I got to hang up because of this like silly interaction. Like all of that is kind of new to people because until I write it out, it doesn't exist anywhere but my own <laughs> brain. So I think that for me is the thing that makes essays really, really personal is I'm not just telling you a thing that happened. I'm telling you the impact it had on me and my like thought spiral afterwards, and, like all the other stuff. That makes me wonder, Erin, do, do you ever wonder if the guy um, who was mean to you and your kid uh, read your book of essays? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> for, for, for like 10 second context, I have an essay in my book about how when my son was really young and he was like two years old, he knocked into another kid at the park and it, the dad of that other kid ran over and I immediately was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, he's a little riled up. I'm sorry. And his child was fine. And he was like, your kid's vicious. And he was really, really aggressive with me. And I kind of like froze. And then I went to my car and cried. And then for years, because this is a parent at my kid's school, whenever I'd see him, I would just like eyeball him and be like, oh, I hate that guy. And I like hung on to this weird grudge for years. And like, realistically, this guy could have just been having like a bad day or something. I don't know him at all. Um, so no, I have no idea if he's right. I would assume no. I don't think he knows I exist. We have like no relationship to one another. But what's funny is when that came out, um, something I made a joke about it on Twitter about you know oh hey there's this uh essay about this grudge I held with this mean park dad like well something about that and other people came out and they were like was it like, was it me like someone else came and said was it me was oh, I no. and I was like no what are, what are you even thinking it's so it's funny when if like someone hasn't read it but they've heard about it they're like oh wait what and I'm like wait when like how many people think they were mean to me like it was really just this one guy <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah that, we'll see I didn't run it by him <laughs> I think that a lot of us who worry about being mean are not the ones who end up being written in that way but I, vicious is a pretty intense word to use about like two-year-old two I mean, that was like vicious like like a wolf or something like what are we expecting yeah <laughs> Like it was like as if he just like went up and bit him on the neck. And I'm like, it was like a gentle shoulder check. And again, he was two. I didn't like thumbs up it, but 
you know. <laughs> it's also really normal for kids, like preschool age kids, to to be weird like that. Like they do mm-hmm. randomly sometimes bite another kid or hit another kid. Like you see it all the time. And it's not great. Oh, yeah. like, you gotta intervene, whatever. But I'm not thinking when it happens to my kid or if my kid does something like knocks into someone. I'm not thinking like, oh, well, throw that it's one out and start over that one. Yeah, exactly. Like even when they do something like biting, you're just like, yeah, it's, it doesn't feel awesome as their parent, but you're like, it's not going to be forever. They're not going to be biting when they're 16. Like, it's cool. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> My littlest one just bit me today. So I'm like, oh, God, please don't keep biting. I got a headbutt one uh, time. Like, we all... We've oh, all is it in the things. nose? When they hit you in the nose, like they always... The bridge. Right? Mm-hmm. With their toddler heads. Excited half the time, not even angry. So Yes, it's when they're jumping and hyper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I feel like every parent has gotten that one bridge hit right yeah. there from a toddler head. And then we can. And they're not, and like <laughs> they're not monsters. They just have giant heads. They're like Cabbage Patch dolls. They right? do have mm-hmm. giant heads, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this brings me to this idea of our kids and the, the, the wider world. And it feels like we're living in a really intense time. I know that a lot of times seem intense for generation to generation, but, you know, I was listening to the radio today and my seven-year-old was kind of like feeling like it was too intense because it was, you know, it was talking about pandemic and it was talking about the war. And it was like, it was just, it was so, it felt like so much. Um, and with global warming too, like my kids are coming home with questions that I don't feel like I can adequately answer. Um, and I don't feel like I can be like, well, this little activity is gonna help fix things. Um, and actually look them in the eye and believe it. So how how are you dealing with that? Like, how are you expressing um, these really difficult things to kids without making them go into existential crises? <laughs> Silence takes over the room. So like all, um, all our kids are in existential crisis mode right now. Yeah, um, I think that, yeah, it's tough. Um, you know, at this point in my life, I'm like a, a stable, secure, like middle class parent. That hasn't always been the case for me personally. But so there's there are different responsibilities. You know, there's a responsibility for me to not shield my kid from some of these issues because, um, you know, the more economic and social and et cetera privilege you have to a certain extent so far until climate change really, you know, whatever, um, et cetera. Like, you know, until it's like really knocking at your doorstep, some people in our society have a choice to shield our kids from from some of this stuff until they hit a certain age and they're in the world themselves. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility not to do that, but, but in terms of how to introduce things responsibly that are not impacting us personally, because if, if it is impacting you personally, then you have to have a conversation with your kid, there's like no way around it. And so if it's something that is is um, is in the news and not impacting you personally, that's more of a choice. But um, like it came up naturally the other day, like the poison drug crisis came up naturally in my household the other day and I had to figure out how to talk to my kid about that. And 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 so I tried, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say how much sinks in. It's hard to say how much detail to give. Um, but I know that if if she asks a question, I'll, I'll answer it. That's kind of my policy. Um, and to have a sort of balance between, you know, she's out in the yard playing, she's playing with herself, like playing, you know, having a good time as a preschooler and, and, and chatting through some of this stuff. So I tend to use uh, opportunities when it like crops up in or as a sort of like not teaching moments, but moments of discussion. And then if she's heard something and she'll ask about it, then then that's another way of having a conversation about it. But it's tough. It's tough. I mean, I'm I'm taking a Twitter break right now because I, as an adult, was just like, this is overwhelming and I cannot deal with it anymore. And there's nothing I am physically doing that's changing shit so i'm just gonna like i'm gonna take a time out and just do the wordle and quirtle in the morning and check in with the news via work because it's part of my job but in terms of the constant stream of like twitter 
No, thank you. Actually, you know, I'm still on Instagram. I didn't take a break from Instagram, but I go to my explore page to like see cakes and I'm seeing like bullshit about the uh, Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. That's awful. It's just like, let me see my cakes. Like, why do we have to get like Johnny Depp uh, uh, propaganda? Um, anyway, I've rambled. I think that was an excellent answer. <laughs> that, that was a great answer. And I, I'm I'm also relieved to also know you're, you know, I, I like what you said about just doing your best. I think that is, you know, it, it is hard to navigate just because they're, they're young. They, they have limited knowledge. They have even their emotional capacity. It's just on, on a smaller, much smaller scale. You gotta, every child is different as well. I know my son is extremely sensitive. Um, there are, we're reading Harry Potter to him right now, and there are scenes. It's not even a violent scene. It's just creeping out of, like, Gryffindor, and she, he cannot even hear it. He's just so – so it's, you know, you always have to kind of tailor, you know, real news to, to fit um, the the child. Um, I like what you said also, just, like, answering answering the questions as, as best you can, um, seizing opportunities if there is, you know, um, an opportunity to teach them about something like any sort of differences or or whatever, uh, you know, just you know, using those opportunities. Um, I really like to turn to children's books because sometimes I don't have an answer right away. And I think in right now in children's lit, there's just so many great books that fit um, the age range. Um, so, for example, last year he, my son was watching hockey and he was asking me about like what's what's two fifteen. Like he was very like what's what school, you know, right? he was hearing just these words from the announcer and not understanding. And um, I was really, really happy that I could uh, talk to him, but also borrow, you know, David Robertson's, you know, when we were alone, which was just, a, I thought that was just so, so, it was such an effective text to use for someone who's um, six or five, six. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm really, really grateful for, for children's lit right now, especially. I think my struggle is that um, I grew up in a household where it was very much like everything's positive and um, like my, for example, with like issues like racism, my parents are not my parents, but my, maybe my mom and my mom's family in particular took the approach of like, kind of like colorblindness, which we know is not effective. Um, so it was like this good intentioned, well-intentioned, like I don't see color, everybody's equal. And so it was always this very like loving a diverse group of people around me in my childhood, but I had no sense of like the hardship certain people faced or like the oppression that people faced. Um, and so with my own kids, I'm always like, how do I explain things to them? Cause I don't want them to be as naive as I was where like, I remember being in middle school and seeing something like something really horribly racist was said to somebody in front of me. And I was like, like I didn't I couldn't believe people still said stuff like that because in, in my upbringing it was like that was all fixed like do you know what I mean like it was really really like I, I grew up in a bubble that was very just like rose colored um so now with my own kids I have those tough conversations but I never know where to stop because I'm like now am I telling them too much like what is age appropriate like I'm and even with like stuff where you were just talking about residential schools like my kids learn about that in school and then they come home and I go like, well, that seems like really tip of the iceberg information. So I always try to tell them more, but I'm like, how much more? And at what point do I go? That's for next year. Or that's for when you're a little more capable of like absorbing that information. So I, I struggle with the line, like where the line is from having them know what they need to know so that they can be like, you know, <sighs> less naive than I was because you can't action anything if you don't know about it right like people talk about being allies all the time but it's like what does any of it even mean and it's like you definitely can't be helping anybody if you're or like speaking up for the right things if you just don't know about it so I'm trying to have it so my kids know a lot more than I did but I just don't know where to stop so I know I you know I feel that so much like when when Black Lives Matter was first um like happening and it was all in the news and everything we we were talking to my middle child about it he would have been about six um and we talked about police violence um and then one day we were walking home and he saw like a police car and a policeman and he like just booked it like just ran home like we couldn't catch him um and we're like okay 
So like not getting the, the nuance in it, like I need him to be able to live in the world, you know, and to so at that age too, there's a lot of like good guy, bad guy thinking. And it's very hard to explain something like um, structural racism or, um, you know, like we, we've been trying really hard talking about gender and especially at a certain age, um, <clears throat> I find kids really go to the most extreme examples of gender, right? Like when they think, okay, what's female? They don't look around at like female identifying people in their world. They, they look at the most extreme version, which is like the Disney princess, even though they don't know anybody who, who looks like that. And same thing for, for what's male. So trying to talk about like there's a spectrum and it's a self-defining spectrum and you can land anywhere and you can change where you are on that spectrum has been an interesting kind of long conversation. Andrea, I know that a lot of your book addresses this. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit specifically about, you know, how we define identity when we're talking with our kids. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, in a household like mine, that it's a yeah it's a conversation that comes up like regularly and my kid yeah because she's four is going through that stage of trying to figure things out I think maybe actually a little later because um because we left kind of things kind of fluid like uh but one thing that we have done um in in all of these areas for all of these conversations um and I think Jillian mentioned like the plethora of kids books that are out there now that um are that are on not on these issues because they're not exactly issues it's just like different ways of being and living and um things that crop up in the world and so spent a lot of time trying to find books that have non-binary parents that were that also have like another story that aren't just about <laughs> like this is what non-binary mm -hmm. is um and that's growing um you know, actually, I think there's been a huge growth over time in that. Um, and we switch up the way we read books, too. So if it's always like, um, I don't know, mommy washing chipmunks ears or whatever in the those chipmunks ABCs, Ooh, a Richard Scary book. Anyway, we just change up who's doing the washing from the, oh, that's dad today. That's the parent today. And so so that might be actually part of the reason why she's four. And like, so who's a guy? And like, she's figuring it out I'm a girl okay okay um but yeah um so so it crops up and then she's asked me like okay so you're not a girl and you're not a boy no I'm a non-binary non-binary person okay and um um yeah it's it is an ongoing thing though like it is something we reinforce and chat about like quite often um but I feel like if you have the, those conversations with kids when they're young, they they like more or less get it. And it, they also at that age, they're not yet like feeling the sort of like socially imposed shame that I think like kids tend to start taking on later. It's just exploration for them at that point. So, um, you know, we talk about um, people who like use of mobility devices and things like that. There are a lot of things you could chat about with a kid who's four, who's just like totally open. Like that person's in a wheelchair. Why? Some people use a mobility device to get around that kind of thing. Like you can just have plain language conversations with kids. Um, and then it's kind of like, okay, cool. And moving along. Um, yeah, has been my experience so far. We'll see what happens when I have a five, six, seven, eight-year-old, and and things get more complicated because uh, they learn a lot at school and and through socialization that's outside of the home, also. So you can't control that kind of, nor would you want to control that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a lot more like Barbie, Ken, yada yada, <laughs> camouflage clothing, <laughs> things of that nature. Jillian, what about you? How are you approaching um, these kinds of conversations about identity? Uh, I think it's also like like Andrew, we just kind of weave it into our everyday um, conversations. I know like, you know, my husband will take a stuffed animal like when he was younger and it's like, what's his name or her name or their name? You know, and just like, you know, kind of, you know, insert it. And so it's, it doesn't have to be like a thing, you know? And, and I think that's important, especially since, 
once it's um, once it's there, it you know that it's I don't know. It's very helpful when there isn't like any. Um, I think uh, I mean that was one thing I, I noticed because I was reading a lot of picture books, as I'm sure we all we all were. <laughs> and then for a period of time, that's all you're reading. And I was like, wow, there's just straight couples everywhere, like in, in picture books, and like they're all wearing and they're all wearing wedding rings <laughs> like that's something i i noticed and so i that was my first you know four into like just looking for books that were diverse and inclusive um you know and and, and really relieved to find them and inserting them into our into our um little library um and there are some things like I, I find very fascinating as well that, um, you know, again, just with the lines and how much do they know, how much are they absorbing? There's this really good picture book called Mixed, um, where you have these, I don't know if you know this book, uh, it's, it's, there's like a red spot, blue spot, yellow spot, you know, and, and then the red says they're the best and then they, you know, they're all segregated and it was a, you know, it was a, a, a great book for, you know, a multiracial um uh, family, which is what we have here. My my husband uh, is is Indian, and so uh, I just remember really in, like so happy to find a book like this, reading it to my son, and having him ask you know really hard questions like why don't they want to mix, right? Um, and and trying to you know understand that, and I and for the first time I remember I tried to like bring it back to us, and I said like. Uh, me and your daddy uh do we look the same to you and he's like yes <laughs> they're both grown-ups <laughs> okay I, I all right i'm it's a, and that was my clue like okay i i don't you know this is like that's a good great answer <laughs> but it's clearly like not what i was you know thinking of so um but I, I think, you know, in our home, there's, he listens to different, you know, you know, he, he has you know, grandparents from both sides. He's hearing languages from both sides. He's hearing different accents from both sides. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously all very different colors. And I, I think, um, you know, just even talking about that, about race, about racial differences, um, it, it's certainly, I can see it because it's been something that I was very concerned about, I think, and something that I just brought up you know, all the time, like he's, he has, uh, there's, it's not a thing, you know? Um, you know, it's interesting because, um, so my daughter's 17 now, and I also, I work at Poetry and Voice, so we deal with a lot of high school students, and I was just doing um, some podcast interviews with them, and I had been noticing in my readings and things going into classrooms that there were a lot more mixed kids than when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I was like the only one that I knew. And there was a lot more, I thought, kind of racial awareness and like conversations about it. And it was very interesting talking to these um, to these kids who were like, you know, between the ages of 14 and 17. And a lot of them had um, picked Cecily Bell Blaine's poem, um, Dear Diaspora Child, and had felt it very deeply. And these conversations that we had were this kind of reckoning where the, the students were talking about the internalized racism that they hadn't known or couldn't name um, that they carried with them um, and that all of the things all of the cultural expectations that they wish they knew or that they wish they had in this sense of forgiveness with the poem and then I you know I talked to my daughter too she's also like mixed race and um, it's interesting because I had kind of felt and probably not you <laughs> but I kind of felt because we'd had all these conversations before I was like okay, it's good. She's good. She, you know, like, it's fine. Like, things are better. And it just, it really kind of reminded me that as they grow and start reconceptualizing themselves and start getting, like, these finer and more subtle ways of thinking about race and their family and all the rest of it, um, it is, yeah, it's just this ongoing conversation that, these kids were fantastic. Like the the next generation is just so intelligent and, and nuanced. And I'm just excited for all of you to have these conversations with your teenagers because um, they bring so much to the table. And um, it's just a good reminder to, to keep asking them even when we feel like we've given them all the tools because they start creating new tools for themselves and then teaching us too. <laughs> Sarah, I wanted to ask you a question. Am I allowed to ask you a question? Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about writing about our kids earlier and uh, how much to share and how much not to share. And you, you have, yeah, I'm wondering if 
if if your eldest has written has read has read what you've written and and talk to you about it if that's a conversation yeah you've had yeah so <clears throat> there's one poem in particular that i felt i i did actually um ask for permission to share so that one was called 12 and it was a 12 part poem looking deeply at her experience of being 12 years old <laughs> with all the fraughtness that happens so you can imagine like that's a lot um and a lot of my poems too aren't just about like the cute things that they do it's also about like really personal like struggles um and so she yeah she read it and she said yeah that's good go for it um and <laughs> i think the only poem the only poem actually that she feels a little bit embarrassed by is called dick pics and the funny thing is is that it it talked about my daughter in it but it didn't actually happen to her it happened to a friend uh but the poem was better if it happened to to her <laughs> but she said it's embarrassing don't like read it publicly in front of me but it's fine to to have the work out and i think again because poetry is like the least read genre i think maybe of literature um, like i don't think that she's afraid that her friends are going to like stumble upon it right i think there's there's more chance of like picking up an essay or even picking up a, a you know a book of fiction and then and then making those those lines cross i often think to have you did you hear about um milne's what happened with his son he had written the the winnie the pooh books um and his son there's there's such beautiful books right and they're so loving his son was terribly bullied for it like beaten up and they used to taunt um uh his son with uh one of the lines from his father's poem as they would beat him and he ended up like learning how to box and stuff to deal with it and gave away all those stuffies to a museum because they held such like fraught memories for him so I often think about that when I'm ready to meet my kids too, but I'm like, it's okay. You're never going to be as popular as Milne. So if <laughs> well, you don't reach a certain level of popularity, you're okay. The um, the guy who who published or founded, that did the um, Chicken Soup for the Soul series, yeah. his son wrote like a, like a blistering memoir. <laughs> Father, that was super funny. Sorry. That that brought up a lot of complexities about their relationship. I found it kind of funny given the context, but I desperately want to read that. Do you do you remember what it's called? No, I'll Google. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to share that. <laughs> oh my goodness, that sounds that sounds really really funny. Um, yeah, I I was just thinking back to we had some pre conversations um over email before we we did this and one thing that came up was this idea of um the pressure to give your kids a magical childhood um and i wanted to talk a bit both about what are the things that you have tried to do and whether they failed or whether it's like worked it and what are the things where you're just like i wash my hands of it it's not real <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think I tried to give my kid, I don't think I've tried to give my kid a magical childhood, to be honest. Um, uh, I, for better or for worse, when I was, I think it was five or six when I discovered that Santa Claus was not real and I experienced it as like a, a horrifying betrayal. Like I found my parents got drunk, they forgot to wrap the Christmas present and I found them in the fruit cellar the next morning on Christmas day. And I was just like, you guys, suck <laughs> I've been lied to and so I did not there was no Santa Claus in our house um, my kid has decided to believe in the Easter Bunny so she yeah she sort of decided um and a few things for herself we do do an Easter egg hunt but I think that yeah um uh she's growing up in a um in a fairly like rural area we have sort of a big yard where we have a lot of plants and a garden and so I Feel like maybe that in retrospect will feel somewhat match i don't know hopefully it will feel some but no i mean i'm not doing any of the intentional intentional stuff. magic i like that yeah um <laughs> and I, I don't know how i'll feel about that or how she'll feel about that when she's older the memoir is called long past stopping and it's by orin canfield long past stopping orin Thank canfield. You. yeah uh, all if you want all the dirt and gossip on uh, chicken soup for the soul, which I did, I guess. <laughs> I? I deeply do. I'm like, that's the next book I'm going to go get. Erin, <laughs> I know you write in your book actually about um, 
the idea of, of Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy and stuff. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I, I hated the whole Tooth Fairy thing. I was, my whole theory on Santa and the Easter Bunny was like, we're going to do it, but we're not going to explicitly like sell our kids on it. And my husband was on board with that. So, you know, we wrapped the gifts and signed them from Santa. But like, if, if I was interrogated, like I would have folded really quickly. Like I wasn't selling that. And so my son at like age five was like, that's you. Right. And then was almost like upset by like, you have to tell me because if it's not you, it's weird. And like, you need, I think you're lying and you need to just tell me. And he was so young. He was like five. So I'm like, yeah, it's me. It's me. Um, and then his older sister was like a full on believer. So at, for a, a number of years, like probably close to four or five years, it was like me and my husband and my younger child all just like lying to my daughter um, <laughs> until she didn't want it anymore. Because as soon as she started to question, I was like, yeah, 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 here's the real scoop. Um, but I don't, I, I've been really flattered. Like when Elf on the Shelf like became a thing, I was like, no, that's not for me. And no judgment for people who enjoy that. I think that's awesome. I didn't want an extra job every night. So, and then they brought them into our kids' classrooms at school and they were just like, so like, why don't we have an Elf on the Shelf? And I was like, cause I don't want to do it. And I basically was like, it's the parents, but don't tell your friends that. But like, I don't want you to feel like the elves didn't come to you. It's just that the other parents are doing that and I'm not. And they were just like, oh, okay. Um, so they were fine with it. But I was relieved when the tooth fairy thing was over because I was like, this is just gross and it's weird and it's creepy and I don't like anything. It didn't feel magical to me. It just felt strange. <laughs> so, but they're, yeah, they're older now. They're 10 and, or almost 10 and uh, 11 and a half. And so there's a, uh, there's no like mythical creatures in our house anymore yeah those tiny teeth are terrible to get out and my son gets bloody noses all the time so sometimes I'm like reaching in and it's wet and I'm like oh my god oh yeah. it's just horrifying it's terrible. yeah it's terrible <laughs> Jillian you guys are making me laugh so much I, laugh so much. <laughs> I have you on mute because I find you also it's I I totally you know can relate um yeah I I uh I, I think one thing that, that happened just with writing this book was just thinking about what I retained from from my own childhood. And it really is sometimes just like the everyday normal stuff or just even, you know, something that your mom cooks regularly, for example, that she probably didn't even think too much about, but you can look back on. Um, and, you know, uh, we I think what we want to do is really kind of give our, our children, you know, really good, you know, memories um, and, you know, uh, I, I think it was a it was two summers ago. So it was a, it was 2020, as you know, and you know, we all know how that was like. And we decided to go, I don't know, somewhere in Quebec, and we rented a you know a little place in a bed and breakfast. And it was such a bad idea because my daughter was like two, and just quit, was so excited. And we went there in the middle of the week, and it was just us, so it was fine. But then over the weekend, all these childless couples started coming in, and and then I started feeling like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, she's just screaming. She's waking everyone up. It was, um, and then I remember when I think back, I'm like, this look, look at me, like, try to attempt to give them, you know, look at the country, look at Quebec, you know, <laughs> and how it blew up in my face. And just, just last week, you know, we had to go to the IGA and my son is excited. He is so, so thrilled. And it's, it's just a grocery store. And he's just like, I can't wait to walk through those aisles. <laughs> and I don't know if it's like I looked at it, I thought, oh my goodness, is it is it the pandemic? Is it what is it that's making you so excited about this grocery store? But he had a blast. We just bought regular food. <laughs> and he was so ecstatic. And I hope he remembers this forever because it was really, you know, aside from the groceries, pretty free <laughs> to do. <laughs> well, that is my so kid loves going to the grocery store too and I think it does feel like a treat in the pandemic because we used to all go together and we don't now usually just my partner goes during the week um we haven't had COVID knock on wood maybe but I don't know anyway I think poor child has gone stir crazy at different points um yeah I think I should say okay the one thing that I do but it really is for myself that I'm sharing is is like food related stuff so I have different like um Jillian what you were talking about reminded me of this I do have different uh food things that I do around like 
holidays that like usually make a gingerbread house. But my rule mm -hmm. is if I don't feel like doing it one year, then we'll take a year off. If I'm going to be doing it in like a resentful, grumpy way, then 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 I'm not going to do it. We're just going to like order pizza. That's my personal rule. Like honestly, for any of that sort of magic type stuff, it's like if I have to do it uh, resentfully, then 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 probably what's going to be memorable is the resentment, and so, <laughs> so we'll take a bye. That is it's that funny, is such like, a good policy. Sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No, I was just gonna say I love like the different definitions of magic because like I come out swinging against like I'm not gonna do all these things, um like you know Elf on the Shelf or whatever. Like my kids don't set like leprechaun traps. Like we're not doing like holidays for every little thing, but they do have to me what's a very magical childhood and that we have a lot of like family traditions. And so, and I think for like my kids, the thing that with my daughter in particular that like when I see her and I go like, Oh, her childhood feels really magical right now is that we're very free about just letting them like go out and explore and play in the dirt. And so she has like her fairy garden and they have a fort in the backyard and they have like all these secret little things like uh, they've set up outdoors and it's, it's very imaginary and special to them. And I don't, some of it I'm involved in, some of it I'm not. Like some of it is just like their own thing that they do. And other things are family traditions that we have. Like we have like, you know, board game nights or whatever. We have certain, like you said, certain meals that we do. And so there's a lot of like routine. And I think that's the magic. Like, is it consistent? Is a thing you do like regularly and it becomes special? And so we have a lot of that, but I just can't. It's anything that I'm told to do. I think it is like you need to do this special, whatever it is for this holiday, because that's what the other parents are doing. I'm just like, no, I'm good. And then I like feel bad about it for about 10 seconds and then I move on. Yeah, that's such a good distinction, too, between like the internal magic of a child and what they're going to remember as being magical in their childhood. And then the, the family traditions that they're going to have like these warm feelings about. And often they're not going to be like I remember Santa. Can I just say to you, I'm really resentful of Santa because I feel like why should this old white guy get all the credit for like the thoughtful gifts that I did? So I always give the worst gift to Santa and then all of the good gifts are from like mom and dad. And they're like, does Santa exist? I'm like, I don't know, but he doesn't give you very good gifts. I'm like, yeah, Santa brought me socks. I'm like, yeah, but what did mommy bring you? Because I'm like, no, I want the credit. Yeah, and the same thing for like the, the food stuff. Like my favorite part of Christmas is we bought this cheap little train, cookie train from Blah Blahs that was dented on sale and we fill it with, full of cookies. And then every night after dinner for like a month, we sing the cookie train song and it makes a stop at every person, every person gets a cookie. <laughs> so the kids get excited whenever the cookie train comes in. Like that's our, that's our big thing. That's adorable. I love the cookie train. <laughs> I also wanted to just add just with like the Santa and the, and the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny. I also didn't really grow up with that. So I think that that helps. Um, and, um, you know, even if he, even if my son asked, because he's asked a number of times if Santa is real. And, and I usually when it comes to the little, you know, these sort of questions where I'm like, I don't know what to say right now. <laughs> my, my, my husband will just come in. He always has a great answer. He's always like, well, you know, like the magic of the holiday season is real. <laughs> you know? He'll kind of go about it like that way, which I think is a good answer. It's, it's true, right? It's, but, you know, we don't have to, like, like you, we don't have to credit all of that to Santa. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, too, because, you know, with all of these, all of us have these different cultural backgrounds, too, and it's kind of like picking and, and choosing what parts. Like, I feel pretty... Um, far away sometimes from my Asian heritage. My dad died when I was um, in my early 20s and he really wanted to assimilate when he came to Canada. So like the one thing we do is um, <clears throat> Lunar New Year, but like a lot of it is just kind of like I'm getting recipes off the internet. I'm like researching my own things and like trying to make this tradition that was like a little bit lost. And then you're wondering like, well, how, like how authentic is it? How real is it? But I mean, at a certain point, like you just have to, do the best you can, right? Like, and there's also, I think, you know, especially, you know, my, my parents came from China and I think it's just, you know, the sort of loss will, will happen. And it certainly is even lost further if because I didn't, I didn't marry someone who's Chinese. Um, 
but there's also a lot of gains and there's also new sort of tradition that you can start as as well and i think that's also very very special too even if it is from the internet whatever <laughs> <laughs> the internet has lots of great ideas <laughs> my family is mostly from from england uh, my grandfather uh, my step grandfather is from jamaica and so i do because i like cooking i will try, sometimes like try to cook stuff for them and so um so they're gonna come visit in august and i'm gonna try making try making them sticky toffee pudding and and trifle <laughs> and we'll see we'll see how it goes i think it tastes like it's supposed to taste but I, the only you know the only stuff i've had is like from a tin from that like part of the grocery store that you know clusters <laughs> foods are like oh here's yeah anyway so i'll i'll report back um and i did have i did learn how to make my grandfather's um he used to make like jerk chicken and jerk pork and um and i asked him to adapt a recipe for tofu for me <laughs> and he humored me and it you know tastes like what i remember it is tasting more 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 or less <laughs> that sounds really good actually i can't see why that spice mix wouldn't work you, we're finding new ways to invent things too because my youngest has five anaphylactic allergies um <clears throat> including dairy and egg so um, like for Easter, I went, I temporarily lost my mind and I spent three weeks making over a hundred chocolates because um, I was like, he's going to have the most normal Easter ever. Uh, and, and, and then I realized when I was absolutely exhausted, I was like, no, that, that wasn't normal. That was you expressing your anxiety through cooking and trying to be magical. <laughs> so. Um, now I know that we're about to we're about to wrap it up. We're almost near the end. And I was just wondering if you guys had any last words of wisdom for any parent who maybe is facing a long night, who maybe is going to be getting up at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. And what can you tell them to just keep going? I really like what Jillian said at the beginning about reading um, the sort of like the the essays from other writers who are parents that aren't about parenting, that aren't like how to talk to your kid will listen. Um, that makes you feel like you're in conversation or like in community with other people, even in these moments that can feel very isolating. And then, um, and then, and then, yeah, always have frozen pizza in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. very good very good yeah. words of advice Erin what about you I think that for any parent who's like struggling at all whether it's like they're just tired or they're having like a a bigger problem the only advice I would be is to talk to people about it because there's always other people going through the same thing um 90% of the feedback I get on my book is people saying like, oh, I thought I was the only one that felt that way. And I'm like, no, nobody, like literally nobody is alone. There's so many of us that feel one way or the other, but there's always going to be a group of people who kind of could commiserate or like hold you up. So I just say, whatever it is, talk about it and you'll, and find your people. Um, and that will help get you through because nothing is harder than doing a hard thing alone. So yeah, that is so, so true. Jillian? Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with what everyone said, the frozen pizza, you know, the, the communicating, finding a community, um, whether it's online or if you need to go to like a, you know, um, I don't know if they still do the parent baby things, uh, you know, during COVID times, but I think that that's very been, that's been very helpful for me. Um, and if anyone claims that they have a perfect baby, you're like, don't be friends with them. <laughs> That's what, you know, they're probably lying. Don't be friends with them. <laughs> They'll just make you feel worse. <laughs> I, I love that. And, you know, my final words of advice would be read these books, honestly. Um, Quiet Night Thing sent me into the woods alone. And like a boy, but not a boy. They are all so good and so different and so refreshing refreshing and comforting and deeply beautiful. I cannot recommend them enough. Like go buy them, 
right now, you will not regret it. And then, well, you might regret it because then you're going to have to buy an extra 20 copies for all of your favorite friends and family, but that's okay. Don't look at your budget. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Andrea, Aaron, Jillian, and Sarah for this great conversation on parenthood. I look forward to reading all your kids' memoirs in 20 years. That's going to be great. You at home, hear more from these amazing parents. Purchase their latest essays, memoirs, and poetry about parenthood. Let's say it again. Like a Boy But Not a Boy by Andrea Bennett. Send Me Into the Woods Alone by Aaron Pepler. Quiet Night Think by Jillian C. And Grappling Hook by Sarah Tiang. Buy them from another story bookshop here in Toronto or from your favorite local bookstore. Thank you for tuning in. We will return this summer with some special City Imagines programming announcements. And until then, we will see you on the street or online for select programs during the June 11th and 12th weekend for the 2022 Watts Festival. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great evening. May all your kids sleep through the night.